holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, God the Father, and our Father, please send down your spirit. Help illuminate the word for the hearing and the speaking that I do that would glorify the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is and who was and is, is to come. Blessed and honor and strength and glory is in your name. Lord Jesus, let us lift up your name and glorify it today and send out the power of the Holy Spirit. Have your way, Spirit, with this service. Fill us with your wonder and your awe and your mighty and your majesty and your power with your Holy Spirit to discern these words. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise of the name that is above every name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I kind of robbed some of those words from a, a song called uh, Revelation Song. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard that. That's a really beautiful, it, it's a wonderful worship song, Revelation Song. Uh, and it's uh, one that got me kind of thinking too. Uh, I was singing, singing at church. I, want, I guess you want to put a message of this. Words matter. They had a church bulletin. This is the truth. I saw a church bulletin. And welcome. And, you know, open up the bulletin. And it says, Hell, everyone. We're glad you're here. Uh-oh. As a oh missing. Mm -hmm. Hell, everyone. Imagine coming into the church and handing a bulletin. Hell, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Wait, I thought I came to church. Another one was, we want you to drop your children off, and after you're done, you can pick up the clothing after they're done. Well, they mixed up one that was for the clothing drop-off, and in the clothing drop-off, they said, you can, pick up your, you, you can pick up free children after service. So they got one word mixed in the wrong. You see how one word can mean a whole lot of things. So uh, I thought that that was kind of appropriate because some of those are bloopers, but really, words really matter what we say we can take our words and make them daggers, unknowingly even, or we can make them a soothing, healing balm of comfort and love. And what we say publicly or privately is still an issue, I think, and I'm still working on my own heart. Uh, here are some comments I've actually heard in churches uh, from my, my experience that I've heard people say when someone may be missing or they may not come, or they may have been sick, they might have had surgery. These, these are real words that they've said. And, and you know, and one of them was like, uh, where have you been? And the guy just went through a, surger, a major surgery and came back and the first thing he hears, well, where have you been, buddy? I mean, he's like tapping his foot, he's not doing that. But rather, would it be better, how have you been? Where and how, one little word changes a lot. Okay, how about this? I have, I've heard this too. I haven't seen you for a while. Instead of, boy, it's so good to see you again. You know, it, it, one is indicting, one is comforting. You know, if somebody doesn't come to church and we worry about them and they're not here, and then we say something like that, a barb at them, so and so is not here again today. Rather, tell me, oh, I hope they're okay today. I wonder how so-and-so is today. And, and these are real expressions that I've heard. I've heard them in different churches. I've heard them all over the place. And I've heard them, uh, I'll just say that I've heard them. One person actually lost their ring down the sink. And, and I don't know if it was a wedding. I can't remember now. It was a wedding ring down the sink. And they were heartbroken. They go, you know, I, I lost my wedding ring. It, 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 or it wasn't what I don't know what it was. And instead of saying, Oh, no, I'm really sorry. That, they said, you shouldn't have put it on the sink. You should have took it off for you. You should have. Well, this person's hurting. They lost something of value. Now you're going to go and put more hurt on them from what they just experienced. So words really, really matter. I'm not done. There's a couple more that I thought was interesting. One person uh, had surgery, and they were, uh, and it's not anybody related here, but it was a person who had diabetes, and they're going to have surgery again, and they're probably going to have to go out and have open me up again and say, well, have you been taking your medicines? Well, have you been taking your insulin? You know, it's like, what's wrong with you? That's the way it's hurt. So our words, whether we mean it or not, 
are not always the most tactful. Right. You know, we can say words in a different way. And besides, if we're wanting somebody to encourage to come to church and they come and the next week they're not here, and, they, and instead of saying, where were you? I says, it's good to see you again. I'm glad you're here. Amen. That's going to do more to bring them back to the body than make them feel shame. And I'm not talking specifically to people here. I'm talking about just the way our words happen to come out. Uh, I could say some others, but I won't. I, I just thought there were some pretty interesting ones. Uh, but instead of, uh, you know, this happened, well, how come you say, I'm really sorry. I'll be praying for you. And, and so what can I do for you and, instead of? So our words can either be daggers, unloving, uh, judgmental, like you should have, you made your, I've heard one person say, well, they made their bed and now they're sleeping in it. A person here, not sitting here today, but they actually, they're not here now said that to somebody who was in a situation where it was not their, their making. And you imagine if that person had heard that. We heard that. We say that publicly. There is a danger that we can assassinate Amen. someone's character with them not here. Or with, even if they are here. To say it publicly is bad enough. Privately it is not any better. So I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians 13 and, and indicating talk is cheap Words have meaning. So you almost think that sticks and stones can break my bones. But words can, they, oh yes, they can. Yeah. Sticks and stones. I've had a couple of weeks ago, I don't think the scar is still here. I was helping my cousin probably three weeks ago. There was a little bit left. It was sticks and weren't stones, but there was, I kind of cut up my hand a little bit. <laughs> Guess what's healed? But the words we say, it's like they're out of our mouth and we can't take them back. Try to unscramble an egg. Ain't gonna you can't do it. And with that in mind, and I'm not addressing, I'm addressing all of it, I'm addressing myself. Uh -huh. I preach first to myself, okay? In verse 1, 1 Corinthians 13. I went back and forth of that. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 13, they're, they're, almost, they're almost a couple joined at the hip. If you look at Romans 12 and, and 1 Corinthians 13, they're very, very close. And I'm not saying that you all are the problem. I said we all. I've been guilty. Even if I don't say it and I think it, I can still think that. And so, I want to try to the way that we change words. We use words, and, and words have meaning. In verse 1, chapter 13, it's talking, it, basically this is kind of a love chapter, if you, if you look at it. And uh, love is one of those things that Jesus said, by your love for one another, you shall know you are my disciples. That's one of the proofs of being a disciple is by loving one another. Uh, and sometimes we say things that are not loving to one another, and we're not necessarily proving we're not his disciples. Uh, we're, we're proving that we're being carnal and we're judgmental by our words. And, uh, you know, the, the word of God is like a sword. So can our words be like a sword. And they can cut to pieces. And our words don't cut in order to heal. God's word cuts in order to heal. Verse 1 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with angels, or the tongues of angels, or men and angels, it should say as though, it should, you could say it even though. You know, if you say a though, beginning, put an even in front of it. Say, even though, or even if, I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I've never heard an angel. Okay, I, I assume the angels talk English, or Spanish, or whatever they do. You know, I've heard there's a phrase in there, you know, uh, the guy's debating about speaking in tongues. Well, I'm speaking the, the tongues of unknown tongue. That unknown word, that word is not in the text. So get rid of that word. You're not going to speak in an unknown tongue. Here are tongues of men and angels. So, and have not love. One of it says charity. I'm becoming a symbol, a brass or a tinkling symbol. You know, the pagans, they'll do it today. They take a, if you've ever watched the gong show, that's an old one. Some of you are too young to remember that. And they had this big gong. Bong, you're out of there. And all that. And, you know, it would be like, I'm speaking love and men and angels, but I don't have love. Bang a gong. That's about as good as that is. You're just making a lot of noise for nothing. The pagans actually worshipped trying to get their pagan gods' attention by banging a cymbal and a gong. That's what he's referencing here. He says, you're just as no better than a bunch of pagans banging on a gong if you're trying to speak to people without love. That, that is what the message, I think that's why he put that in there. 
He's not wanting to teach us about pagan history. He's trying to use it as an example of what they do. And if we're going to be like the world, you know, we want to be more unlike the world, you know, because if somebody, I got a letter today that was a very hateful letter from one of the articles I wrote about baptism. And I, and I showed Tom, I didn't show all of it. And then they put graphic images of, of women in there. And I didn't know that. So that's shame on them. But uh, that's not loving. They're trying to think, well, you made a mistake and, and your baptism teaching is wrong and you're misleading and you're a disappointment. And uh, this person is a Christian and we're speaking in love? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that person's heart. Verse 2. And though, again you can say, or even if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, this is God. That's being like God. Even if I'm God. That's good. God only has all of this. Okay. Even if I had complete understanding and I got three PhDs and I got four doctorates and I went through here and I know everything there is in the Bible and I don't have love, it's rubbish. Yeah. It's worth nothing. Amen. In fact, some of the seminary professors I went through, uh, they're not as strong in the faith as far as believing in the divinity. Now, the Moody was very strong. Another seminary that I began with, I was a little bit disappointed, and that's kind of the reason I moved. Uh, they, they did not hold to the veracity of the Bible. They thought, you know, the, the, the divinity of Christ and those things like that. So I was really disappointed. So even though they've got all these PhDs, they don't know nothing Amen. if they don't believe in the divinity of Christ. Amen. That's worth nothing. So even if I have three PhDs and 17 letters after my doctor, reverend, master, mister, yeah. <laughs> I'm nothing without love. And all knowledge, if I have all faith, so that I could move a mountain, I could move that mountain, but the guy standing there to watch the movement, you're sick, it's your fault, why didn't you do it? How come you didn't? That doesn't mean nothing. It destroys all of our witness to the saved and the lost. And if I have not charity, I have nothing. You know, in other words, charity means love. If you look at it this way, if you gave to charity, you're loving because you're giving. So the old English word charity, love, is basically the same thing. Really, love is charity. Mm -hmm. if, if you're taking and helping someone, uh, last week that a lady came up to me at Salvation Army and said, See the little girl over there? She's wearing the clothes we brought over there that we brought, and it were not my clothes. A friend of, of Martha's childhood friend donated some of those clothes, and that made me really feel really, really good. That's charity. That's loving her. But you know what? If I do all that, at the very end, it says, I am nothing. And guess what? Nothing is not a little something. It is nothing. I am nothing. I'm I, I'm a deacon, I'm a treasurer, I'm an elder, I'm a pastor, I'm a... It's nothing! It's not love. It's nothing. Amen. Verse 3, and though, or even if, I emptied my wallet and my bank account, is not, I'm kind of paraphrasing there, bestill all my goods, and Paul's too, thank you Paul, to feed the poor, <laughs> and though I gave my body to be burned, and have, don't have charity, it profits me here, my prophet. Zero. Zero. If I have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Verse 4. Charity suffers long. It doesn't suffer for long, this long and then all of a sudden now it's going to react and I've had enough. It never says that. It's unlimited. It suffers And is kind. Charity or love doesn't envy. That one gets me. That's the one that coveting that got Paul. He it, it's really hard not to covet. Love doesn't vaunt itself up. Imagine the old, and here's an image of it. You've got a barricade and you've got this one catapult. And that's the vaunting up. But now put yourself, instead of the weapon, you're in there and you're vaunting yourself. That's what that means. It, it's, it's almost like a peacock. You're vaunting yourself up. And if you're doing that, it doesn't mean anything. You know, when, when you hear things like uh, this and that, 
and you know, you did this and we did that and that's so good. Cool. It's just, I'm not getting up on the catapult. It's all glory to God. I don't want to get up on the catapult. I want to not vaunt myself because when God begins to use a person and they don't remain humble, then God can't use them. So it's good to hear those things, but it's, yeah, it sure feeds our ego when we hear so-and-so did so-and-so or, or, or a nice job. And it's good to encourage others, but don't believe your own stuff. You know, I'm not going to try to believe my own stuff. And nice. it's so easy to do. Charity doesn't vaunt itself or flaunt itself. It's not puffed up. There's a blowfish in the, in, in the ocean, and it's a little tiny fish, and if you've seen a fish, it's a little blowfish. But when you get near it, it goes, Pfft. that's puffed up. And you know that blowfish is poisonous, and when it puffs up, it gets, it's deadly, and you don't want to touch it. Same thing with, I think that's the, I, the idea that I came up with here, that if, if it's puffed up, it's not going to do anything but harm. It's going to hurt others, and uh, no one's going to be around want somebody that is so full of themselves that there's no reason, you know, there's, it's all about them. And verse 5, 1 Corinthians 13, does not. Now, it starts out like that. Does not. That's an odd way to start a sentence. So put a first word in front of that. Because you're talking about love. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Like the person that sent me that this morning in that letter, that's unseemly. That's wrong. And it's supposed to be another Christian who's trying to correct me about baptism. And they sent me some images in there. And that's not wrong. That, I mean, that's totally wrong. That's, that's unseemly. For It's un, out of character for a believer in Christ. Love also doesn't seek her own. It seeks your best interest, mm. uh, like, like Philippians 2, uh, look upon the interest of others and not yourself. Exactly. And, and that's the way Christ did it. He looked upon himself, uh, of others, before he ever looked upon himself. Love either also is not easily provoked. It's pretty easy. Somebody, some people have a hair trigger, uh, or you walk around them and there's eggshells. And then you feel like if you say the wrong thing, it's going to be, you know, interpreted. They're going to take it the wrong way. But uh, the thing here is, it is saying that it's not easily provoked. The Bible says, fathers do not provoke your children mm -hmm. to, you know, to breathe. You provoke, your pro means putting forth ahead of time. Uh, so love is not offensive, uh, is what he's saying. But it rejoices in the truth. Hallelujah. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians 13. Now again, you're missing a word there. I think it should you, it'd make better understanding if you put it inside or before every sentence. It makes more sense because it says, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. In other words, I think what it says that love bears all things that we grin and bear it, so to speak. We bear with one another, bear with one another's faults and shortcomings because yep. uh, when I see someone else's shortcomings, I'm thinking, look in the mirror, man. Look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. I mean, that's my first reaction. I, and, and, well, I guess you should say my second reaction because sometimes my carnal nature goes, boy, look at him. Shouldn't he? You know, what if they... And, and then, no, I, I have to bear up with... Uh, one another because they're putting up with me and others. Next one, believes all things. First Corinthians 13, 7. I believe that love believes all things is gives person a benefit of the doubt. It, in other words, it believes the best of someone. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Carla and, and Robert are we're not here, and we're going to think, well, you know, and we didn't know about their trip, and I don't know why he went with them or not. I don't know that, but we're going to say. Well, looks like Robert, they're not going to be here again today. I wonder where they're at. And without assuming or uh, giving them the benefit of the doubt, they might be sick. They might be home ill. They might have a family member who died. Uh, they might, he might be on a mission trip. Uh, I, I'm speaking just to myself, too. But it wants to get, it assumes the best. Even if it, uh, the worst happens, ends up being, at least I've not got it backwards and I've assumed the worst, and, but actually it was the best. And it makes me feel like a heel a time or two that I've done that. 
because I've assumed the worst and I've judged them and I, and I was not right. So love believes all things. It doesn't mean I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona. I want you to, I love you and I want to sell you some of it. That doesn't mean that. It means you give them credit for what you don't know is in their life. Uh, we, we just don't know a lot of things and it's better that we don't know. So love gives people the benefit of the doubt and it endures all things, it hopes all things. In fact, uh, it endures the shortcomings of people. It hopes the best for Paul. Paul's, we're hoping the best for him and his hearing and, and his healing, healing and hearing. That's kind of goes together. <laughs> so we're, we're gonna hope for that. We're gonna believe that and we're gonna believe God will. And if he doesn't, then we still believe in God because God is sovereign. He knows what he's doing. Uh, so Amen. we believe. Verse eight, love never Failed. You know what? I, I failed a lot of times. In fact, uh, one course back in when I to Newman, I had to get out of it. It was a problem in stats class and math. And I says, "Love never fails, but math does." I mean, I'm going to fail this. You know, this was very difficult, worse than uh, trigonometry. It was. It was, and I, I didn't realize what the name of the class was. And so, it was. I was failing. Uh, students fail. Love never fails, ever. But where there are prophecies, guess what? Prophecies, they're going to fail. Well, well, how about tongues? Now, tongues, originally here, tongues is language. And I do believe God can still use tongues in certain parts of the world when I'm uh, speaking to other people. Uh, it is not a common practice now. But I think is what Paul says, and Dr. McGee agrees, some of the, these are cessationists. Some of these have ceased in the current church, but they are still, God can still do what he wants to do. You don't see them as prevalent. You see, in fact, if you look at the book of Acts, those things start disappearing. And by the uh, one third or halfway through, they're gone. Because they did not have the scriptures to show the signs and wonders that this must be God. Once they had the scriptures from Peter and some from Paul, and, and as early, I think, as 45 AD, they had uh, one of the gospels out they had scripture and they didn't need the miracles by then to prove that these men were from God. So I can speak in tongues, I can speak in prophecy, I can know all there is, I can, I can have PhDs, I have to know all knowledge, but if I don't have love, it's nothing. It's, it's no better than used toilet paper. I'll be putting it bluntly. That's all that is worth. That's kind of strong out of my apology, but in case in point, so whether they're tongues, prophecies, teaching, tongue, whatever, verse 8, it will all vanish away. And I think all of that will uh, in the kingdom. But for now, verse 9, for now we know in part, you know, we don't have a whole lot. We just got like a snap. The Bible says we see through a glass darkly and we don't see everything. But we only see what part and we prophecy in part. In other words, uh, we have a lot to learn. We can only get part of the prophecy here. The context of prophecy is pro or forth telling. That doesn't mean today, you know, the Packers are going to beat the John or whatever. That's not predicting the future. Every time you read prophecy, it does not mean predicting the future because there are two or three different meanings. Uh, in the context here, I believe, it, it is possibly meaning uh, teaching. So you have all knowledge and he's saying prophecy. But when that which is perfect is come. I don't see nobody in perfect. I don't see anybody here perfect. I think this is speaking of Jesus Christ who is perfect. The one who is to come. Then that which is in part shall be done away. In other words, when he gets here and we're going to have the first thing we're going to think we're going to say in heaven is aha. Uh -huh. Because we're not going to get it, you know, until maybe much later we're going to understand at that time why did Paul have to go through this? Why did blah, 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 you know, just fill in the blank. And in fact, what did I say right there? It just says in verse 12, it says, now we see through a glass darkly. I didn't even look ahead. I should have read ahead. Okay. We do see through a glass darkly. So I guess that is correct that I say we see in part now. So accidents happen. I listen to a good teacher, Dr. McGee, so some of that is rubbed off on me and some of you have rubbed off. And now, verse 13, now, faith, hope, charity, but the greatest of these is faith. Hope, wait, no, hope. 
No. Raise your hand. Charity. Yeah, that's it. You, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? If you have those three, door number one, two, no, wait, no, two, three. Love conquers all. Uh, in, in fact, with, you, without love, uh, it, it's rubbish. In fact, uh, let me touch on it, just a couple verses here, and, and I'll close with Romans. I was going to do both chapters, but it's going to be too much because it's a lot of stuff here. But I, I want to just touch on a couple of verses uh, in Romans 12 because I think these two go together that in verse 3. When you're thinking about words matter and what, what are words uh, that we say to others, that in verse 3, Romans 12, that we are not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. I think he's saying that we shouldn't love our, uh, think highly of ourselves more than we ought because we, we are not highly. I mean, we, we ought not think that at all. Uh, I'm thinking highly of myself. We shouldn't think that because you're not. God is high. He's lifted up. You're not. You're carnal. Uh, you're, you're just like the rest of us. Uh, all has fallen short of glory to God. So knowledge really can puff up. And so, a couple other things before I mention that. We are many members of one body. Today when we laid hands on Paul, he's one member of the one body. And guess what? He's one member of all of us. It says, every one member, one of another. So what happens to Paul happens to us. You know, Paul might get hurt and he might have to have surgery or he may have to do this or that. But that's just not in isolation uh, because, you know, it, it's like, if, they, if someone attacks Paul, uh, then they're attacking us. Mm -hmm. Because really, what hurts Paul uh, hurts us. And what is good for Paul is good for us. So, a couple other, and I had them marked here. Here we go. The last few verses, I'm going to finish with 9 through uh, 14, I think. So, love is the main thing. Love is, is motivating our words. Love, love behind it be behind every word that we say because it says here in verse 9, Romans 12, let love be without dissimulation. In other words, let it be genu genuine. Dissimulation just means sincere. Just be, don't have a hidden agenda. You know, I, I love you uh, and in the next five minutes, I need, can I borrow your card? You know, I need your card. And, you know, it, it's got to be sincere uh, brotherly love and sisterly love. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. And okay, and now verse 10. Be kindly affectionate toward one another with brotherly and sisterly love and honor, preferring one above another. That is, in other words, you're, you are esteeming others better than yourself. You're preferring others above yourself. So there's a lot of meaning in our words. And our words can hurt and and. Our words are, can be like darts, and we might make it sound like we're well-intentioned. Uh, for example, if some, we haven't uh, seen somebody where they were supposed to do this or they didn't do that, or uh, Paul will show up at the nursing home because he's got a food issue, and I could see him and I didn't know it, and I wasn't here maybe, so I show up and I'll call, Paul, where were you at? You know what? I thought you were going to be with me. Well, he is having issues with the food. See, so my words can either be healing or they can be hurting. Uh, they, can, they can be daggers, or they can be medicine. Uh, they can tear down, or they can build up. And, and I believe words matter. So I'm gonna, next time uh, that we come together and somebody's not here, and you haven't seen him for a while, try to remember, you know, instead of where were you, how are you? One little word can mean a lot. Being asked that question, where were you? That's a big difference. And so I hope that that helps some of us think before we speak. And usually I'm speaking and then I think, uh-oh, you know, I'm going to try to get it the other way around. Words have meaning. And I don't want to hurt anybody with my words. I know you don't either. Even when we don't know it and, we're in, and our intentions are not to do that, sometimes it comes out that way. And it's just the way it, you know, we don't mean to. So I say that to myself and I say that to you. And we got a new church in Nigeria now. 300 years, 300 strong, and uh, I'm glad to have him here too. So it's funny how some of the messages, I'll send these messages, and when they, next week they'll message me, this is what we needed, we were talking about that. That's God's spirit. Yes. I, I, I'm not responsible. I'll blow stuff up real easy. You know, I'm a klutz, but you know, my girls have all the grace at home, and I have zero. And that's uh, 
pretty much nothing. So anyway, would you close for us, sir? Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for the week that you've given us, for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, and how you watched over us and cared for us. Lord, we do pray that you would help us in the coming weeks to take heed to the word we've heard today and be careful with our words and what we say to other people. Lord, may we be an example and be a testimony of love and caring to others. Thank you for this church, for and Lord, we pray that you continue to bless it, strengthen it, and cause it to grow. For we ask in Christ's name. George, I am very glad to see you. And I do miss your wife. She has a sign. <laughs>